um, I guess I should start by apologising for, for having forced Berit and the other organisers to uh, make a rapid adjustment in schedule. Um, but thank you very much indeed for, for the invitation. Yeah, and, and introduce yourself a sure. little bit. Sorry, that yep. lost so, by these quick changes. That's fine. Um, so my name's Michael Grubb. I'm a professor at UCL. Uh, at the Institute of Sustainable Resources, which kind of merges very well with the, the Energy Institute, which really does most of the, the model development. Uh, I'm not a modeler. I don't uh, run any particular model. Um, it's probably 20 years since I actually did modeling. So I'm kind of a lazy guy and a really annoying one that sits in the corner and critiques models and comments on models and kind of indicates what they might be good for and not. Uh, and um, what I, I'm not quite sure what the organisers were really expecting from me, but what I want to try and do is to canter through a few remarks about the generalities of what, what are we modelling for and how to think about the activity. And I apologise if some of that is very familiar, maybe touched yesterday. Uh, to go into a little bit about ways of thinking on model classification, uh, to just flag an aspect of that drawn from history where I was involved in a quite a major comparison project, uh, and, and a few thoughts and more recent work, which I think bears a bit on model classification and the kind of conclusions and things we're after. So, uh, if nothing else, I hope to be saying something a little bit different and perhaps rather provocative. Uh, we shall see. Um, okay, when you see a slide in black like that, I have simply stolen it ruthlessly from my colleagues in the Energy Institute, uh, and in particular Ilka, um, who I think many of you will, will know, and teaches a, a, a module on uh, modelling as part of the master's course. And I'm not going to dwell on this, but I thought if, if you haven't run through it before, it's just worth reminding ourselves at the outset, any model is basically a simplified mathematical attempt to represent something, um, which we hope has some relationship with the real world and is inevitably going to be an imperfect representation because, frankly, the only complete test of the real world is, is what actually happens, uh, by which time it's a bit late. Um, so... When you have constructed these sets of equations, um, you have to populate them with data, some of which is direct, some inferred from various issues. And then what it is, is potentially a very powerful framework for analysing a system given the structural assumptions and data inputs. That is not a crystal ball which can ever predict the future. And quite outside of the energy uh, world, we see lots of examples uh, that feed in, at least in terms of economics modelling, to the old saying that an economist is somebody who can explain to you why their last forecast was wrong. Um, the question is, did the whole exercise generate insights or something useful, at least in, in either for the analytic community of understanding actually how different things in the world are connected, or for the policy community? Um, now... That's actually quite interesting. What, what are we modelling for? And I think a, a, a common rule and assertion is we're modelling, for those who've really got experience of it, say we're modelling for insights, not for numbers. Um, and that goes back for a long time. And I used to be chief economist at the Carbon Trust. And I, I was, having invested quite a bit of time in understanding models, I was a little bit taken aback when our chief executive said, you know, the really good model." A really, really good model is one where you look at it, you look at the answers, and you think, that's funny. Oh, right, now I understand what's going on here. Now I can throw the model away. Don't need it anymore. Just given me the insight that I wanted and actually how the system will work. Um, because a real-world decision, I'm factoring in lots of things in my head that the model couldn't factor in actual data, but I've got a deeper understanding. And that is largely true. The problem, uh, as Ilka, I think, had flagged in this, is, yeah, they might say they want insights, but quite often what they really want is some numbers. Um, the question then is, is actually how good are they, and do they cope with the inherent uncertainties and the qualifications, etc. I won't run through the list at, at the bottom. Um, but I think it is genuine tension to think about 
I mean, model owners inevitably tend to, to place greater confidence in their numbers, perhaps, than is justified. But some of the policymakers will do so even more, even if you try and qualify it. Because it's kind of simpler to say, oh, the number was this. But there are limits, definitely. Um, and and I'll, let me give you one personal example again from uh, a time I did as a senior advisor to the UK energy regulator, Ofgem. We had a huge process running over years and years on the reform of the transmission pricing system in Britain. And we got a model from consultants, which are more and more complicated. I wasn't sure I could understand what was going on. And I tried, I was there partly to advise and quality control. I said, but that's not consistent with that, etc. Anyway, this model ended up saying the benefit from this regulatory reform will be £1.5 uh, billion. Pounds. Um, and there was no real sensitivity study. I'd asked for it, and the modeler said, well, it's so damn complicated, it takes so long to run, we really can't do any sensitivity testing. I thought, well, gee, thanks, guys. And after we published the draft decision, uh, RWE mounted a legal challenge. They hired other consultants, and they said, no, the result is going to be minus 4 billion, as opposed to plus 1.5. And you can imagine what a mess that all created. We did actually win the legal challenge, not because anybody believed either number, but just because we had kind of followed due process uh, to a sufficient degree. But one of the things is, it really cemented a view in the board of Ofgem that this business of modelling had gone too far. In effect, the board, which is responsible for the decisions, was being given a model too complicated for anyone understand, to understand, with assumptions that they weren't at all convinced by, like the discount rate and loads of other things, and an answer that nobody really believed but was the only number they had upon which to try and justify the regulatory decision. Now, that's not a great situation to, to be in. Uh, a number of these issues, incidentally, I don't have answers. I'm merely pointing out some insights and observations from my, my personal experience. So um, there's some of the more cynical remarks about modelling. Um, the issue, more than the first bit, you've probably heard those kind of comments before. I think there's a real dilemma around the complexity issue because the more complex I've already outlined and indicated some of the problems, um, but the more simplified, actually, you may be making really crucial simplifications, which means that your insights are actually misleading, fundamentally. And, and I'll give a, a potential example in, in a moment. I think it is generally true, not, not entirely, but generally true, as much as conceivable, you let the question drive the modelling and not the other way around. You say, what is the question they're trying to answer? What's the question the policymakers trying to answer? Is my model appropriate to that question? Um, there's the old, um, the old saying that if all you've got is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail, uh, in which case I would tempted to add, if you're asked a very different question, you're screwed. Uh, the English will recognise the pun in that, that statement. Um, but, but that is a kind of, of problem. So try and bear in mind that, you know, what your model really is good and, and, and not, not good for. Um, we have seen, insofar as models are used to inform public policy making, some pretty embarrassing cases. Uh, one of the most high level was over a, a many multi-billion pound rail infrastructure investment where a legal challenge was mounted, which was successful because it managed to prove that the government had completely messed up uh, the modelling and that made actual errors. That led to the McPherson report, which became the sort of the Bible of how the government expects models to be done, verified, etc. Um, and, and it's worth looking through. And I suspect actually that quite a lot of academic models would not pass the McPherson tests about how can you have some confidence in the robustness. Uh, but there's quite a lot of pressure. Uh, in the, certainly the UK circles to say, well, has this model gone through the McPherson type of process? Again, I'm not going to go into detail about what they are. You can see the headlines or look at the, that report. Um, so that's a context. Let me move on to some words about model classification. Again, with another caveat, which is there is no perfect classification because the problems are too complicated. There are too many dimensions. Here, if I'm right in counting, we have eight different dimensions you can think about. I could actually add more to that list if I tried. 
nobody can usefully have a classification system that has eight or nine dimensions and put it down on a piece of paper. You just try. So you kind of have to choose which do you think are the most useful dimensions of classification or where can you group some of these things. Um, now, this is one pretty classical typology. Um, I would note that I think like most model typologies derived within the modeling community, it focuses on the methodology. There is a case, I think, also for a sort of parallel typology, which is based on what kind of questions is a model designed for, uh, which, which would have some mapping onto methodology, but is a slightly different way of approaching the classification question. Um, again, I, I, I suspect many of you will know these kind of classification schemes better than I do. Um, this is, I think, fairly common to think in terms of bottom-up versus top-down, about the different components, designs in those, and then sort of some of the fun and action is when you try hybrid models, and actually the, the E3MG FTT model is a pretty good example of a hybrid model, though you can get all sorts of hybrids out there. Um, again, neither time nor, nor role to really put down one, but this is the example that is used in UCL about a way of thinking about, you know, the classification where models can fit. Something that I actually find, you know, probably the, you know, amongst, oh, sorry, and then, then flags a number of interactions between those, those various components. Um, and of course, it's there also, it's worth pausing because depending upon the question, those interactions may be really important or almost entirely irrelevant. And that should say something about how ambitious do you need to be in the scope of model and the linking, etc. Um, I found this chart actually quite a useful. Probably, if I was going to be forced to land on one way of classifying models, I would find this a pretty leading candidate. Uh, so vertically, you've got the degree of macroeconomic representation, uh, which you might say the scope of the model outside of a purely you know, energy sector. Um, you have, from left to right, the x-axis, the technology richness, and then the third dimension there is the behavioural complexity. Now, I don't want to say more about the vertical axis. Uh, it's got the sort of the different branches that were just flagged. Um, they tend to class to clump into optimization approaches, um, of which general equilibrium is, is the classical you know, representative example where probably the whole system is optimizing according to some sort of common decision metric assumes to apply to all actors uh, with with f perfect or uh, approximate uh, foresight versus the econometric model which says well I have no theory I'm not assuming anyone's optimizing anything I just have data from the past and I'll extrapolate that to the future and run mathematical regressions so they're the sort of two main clumps of, of macroeconomic uh, analysis um, let me say a word about the behavioural dimension and what, what you will soon see is I just flagged actually that vertical direct dimension is not one single thing, it's a cluster of different approaches. The same is true on the other two axes um, and on the technology axis I did want to just draw attention, sorry, and you, can, you yourselves can see where different types of model could be located in that, that 3D space. Yeah. Um, again, people always look after. These are the attempts to develop more complex models where they move move along additional axes. Um, I'm kind of not a big fan of trying to get the perfect energy model. I'd rather know what kind of question and then see what's what's the perfect model for that question. But if I move on to this technology innovation axis, um, I'm going to dive into some rather old work with apologies that know it. But it dawned on me, it is still maybe relevant. You, you can tell me if this is, you will know this and it's now outdated. Actually started with debates late 90s and early 2000s about broadly the te exogenous or technology push uh, view on technology, which is, well, it kind of happens. Stuff gets cheaper and that's really nice. That's great. Um, versus, and on, particularly if we put some R&D into the system, versus the endogenous or market pool, which says, well, stuff happens for a reason because there's some kind of economic or other policy driver. And again, without time to go through all this, 
the stunning thing is how many policy decisions completely invert depending upon what structure of technological change you include, what you think actually happens. Uh, a classic example is photovoltaics. You go back, the, the central column there, the exogenous technology push, tends to be the ones to which um, sort of classically trained economists tend to gravitate, not always by any means. Uh, but it tends to generate, for example, the idea that subsidising photovoltaics 15 years ago was a really stupid thing to do. It was unbelievably inefficient. Look at the cost per tonne of CO2 saved. What on earth were the Germans and Japanese thinking of? And 15 years later saying, hey, great, the solar revolution is going to save the planet. Like, well, you know, there's some thinking to be done there. And was the, actually, on the right-hand side, it was a very sensible thing to do if it drove cost reductions in an absolutely central technology. But, you know, all sorts of different policy dimensions hinge on how you think technology change happens, not on whether your model is rich in technology. And if you say, I've got a fantastically complicated technology model, it's got all these different sectors, all these different technologies, but by the way, it's so complicated that I can't possibly model it exogenously, so I'll just assume all future costs. Well, you know, you may have made a fundamental mistake in terms of when you then gen try and generate insights, policy events. Um, I don't think I've got time to run much through this project. We made an intense effort about 10 years ago to try and say, well, how are people trying to model endogenous technological change? Because it's kind of complicated. Um, we ran through a classification you can look at there. And just to say, well, the results were kind of all over the place. This one being in terms of energy intensity and carbon intensity. And on the left-hand side, it's the models run without induced technical change on the right with induced technical change, you tended to find that those induced technical change put more emphasis upon fuel substitution, new low carbon sources as opposed to intensity. On GDP also and carbon pricing, the results similarly could be all over the place. Now, in a sense, that was problematic. But what you realise is this is a rich area, it's a fairly new area, the equations is all sorts of ways of representing, and most fundamentally the data input was very uncertain. Now, that's useless in one sense for a policy conclusion, but it is very interesting in research terms. Now, I've got, I want to say if I'm allowed a few minutes on the other axis, <laughs> I'm going to be horrible and plough on anyway. Um, because I just want to touch on this behavioural angle with a, 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 an approach that some of you may, may be aware of. Um, the point is, if we're talking, and I assume we're all here about the sort of energy issues and energy transformation, we have a, one in which we're looking at how people and entities use energy at a very micro level, individuals, you know, corporate behaviour, etc., and a very big macro level. And I spent a while trying to think about the structure of what's going on and it came up with a slightly odd diagram where what most of the models traditionally have done is assume you have optimizing behavior of the agents and in that sense the economy settles at some kind of best practice frontier and is then making lots of trade-offs between different resource inputs into the system defined by the technology frontier or its exogenous projection. Fine. What I just talked about was the axis of, yeah, but how does that technology frontier evolve and why? And what direction does it evolve into? Does it enable us to get, you know, just, just more carbon to generate more output or actually much higher carbon productivity, which is the lower angle? What shapes it? What affects its speed of technology evolution and its direction? And that's broadly where the innovation endogenous change issue comes in so much and uh, it's a central issue that I just touched on. But the other angle is on the other side of the frontier, there's enormous amounts of evidence that we don't have optimising agents. There's all sorts of inefficiencies, structural and behavioural and organisational and contractual and split incentives. Anything to explain the fact that most of those red crosses represent how real people and real organisations behave in the real world, which is not anywhere near the technology frontier. And that's what in this, this framework is called first domain modelling. What it tries to say is this is not a debate about which of these is right, but it is really about, at a very small scale, short term social agents, you're often dealing with these behavioural and contractual and lots of other anomalies. In the middle, you've got classic market behaviour. And in the long term, 
and the large scales, you are tending to deal with transformational processes. So they're all right, but it depends upon what time scale you're looking at. And as almost final observation on this front, note the faster the technology frontier moves, the more important the first domain, the behavioural, etc., becomes. So the ideal that I would love to see is a really well-developed three-domain model which had market behaviour, which had induced innovation, and which had all the behavioural anomalies which de determine whether or not people make good use of those innovations, or how rapidly, or how big the lags are, etc. Um, I think I have yet to see a third, three, full three-domain model. I'm going to skip this in view of time. That's kind of what I've said, but is a reminder to me to say that along with this, I talked about sort of processes. There are policy pillars that go along with that. The policy pillars have different structures of investment and returns to the different actors. And I'd say if there's one more recent insight that I've gained from my last few years of research, it's that the financial dimension of all this is really crucial. Um, and I know that the, the Cambridge and the Econometrics and, and Jean-Francois have done some really insight into how finance partly explains the radical difference between general equilibrium and econometric at a big scale. And boy, does it explain a lot of the weirdness that goes on at the more micro level about what technology get adopted and what market structures and why. I don't have to go into that, but if I was to say one place to think seriously in new modelling frontiers, it's has your model got a finance sector and does that finance sector bear any relationship to what happens with money in the real world? Because one thing I can assure you is it does not all perfectly go to the optimal technology at identical rates of return or even identical risk rewards. So uh, my conclusion is your, your task is uh, not finished as modellers. There's plenty to be done. Um, I think you could summarise some of that uh, by saying that you know, key features are in this technology, which implies how adaptable is the system, the adaptability of the energy system to constraints and incentives, the path dependence, which flows from both those first and third domain stuff, and the finance, including the behavioural dimensions of finance. And those strike me as some of the really interesting frontiers. I've covered a lot of ground, too briefly, but still probably a bit too long. But... Anyway, I hope that has been of some interest. Thank you. Still there, you can still go for the question. Thank you very much, Michael. In the beginning, we just, what we learned, we were mailing and, uh, before that, and he sent us some of the graphics, and we were really discussing for the model matrix, which axis are we going to take? And the, I think... I learned much more about the models when I were discussing where on which axis what which model would uh, would be placed, and that was really interesting. I mean, now we we uh, we decided for some axis, and everybody can just say, yeah, no, but another axis would have been better. It, we, you would never take the the best decision on the axis because that's what Michael just said. It's it's mm -hmm. too complex to put a model in a in a certain place. But discussing where it is that. That helped us a lot, didn't it? <laughs> to understand the models. So maybe thank you very much. And are there questions about this? Thanks for that. Uh, Robbie Morrison. Uh, you put on a slide uh, open source, but you didn't talk to that particular point. Um, I'd like to note first that there's a huge difference between transparency and openness. Um, I can't do anything with a transparent data or transparent uh, model, but I can do a lot with an open data and an open model. Um, there's a revolution on it, the, revolution on at the moment um, in terms of uh, open energy modelling um, and open data, uh, stemming from about 2010. Um, can you make some comments on that particular topic? I could try, but I'd only be bluffing because I think some of my colleagues are actually closer to that field. Um, the slide did note the tensions. Uh, model development can be very expensive. Um, where transparency comes in is if you want the decision makers to know what's behind the numbers they're being given. That's where transparency comes in as opposed to openness. For modelers, of course, you want to be able to get your hands on the damn thing and run it and change assumptions and test it. Um, but it's no, I, I'd 
don't really want to comment more, to be honest. I think others are much closer to that area of what, what's sensibly open and what's not, and, and how do you verify, you verify and use that. Thank, thank, thanks for the great presentation, that's my sentence. The question is, um, talking about financial modeling, so there's, what do you suggest people look into? Would it be looking at trying to understand risk premiums in different places, some of the concessionary type finances? Is, is a discount rate something that's just too blunt and simple? Would you like to see that, uh, the, the modeling team sort of splitting that up into costs of capital, equity, market? What would, what would be the kind of things that you would think would be would be the big wins that people could look at first, and how would we test whether or not it's any good? Thanks. Um, I think probably the answer to that does start a bit with what kind of question you're trying to answer. Um, but nevertheless, I, I would start by familiarising oneself with a bit of the, the basic concepts and evidence. And think about how that affects what what you're what you're saying, how you're using language, even. So, for example, we talk about the cost of renewable energy. The cost of renewable energy has come down one, you know, tremendously, etc. If you actually look at the data and say, what is the cost of wind energy? It's an almost meaningless question. If you ask what is the cost of wind energy in Germany, it's really cheap. If you ask what's the cost of wind energy in Greece, it's really expensive. Why? Because the cost of finance in Greece is, uh, I don't know, four or five percentage points higher than in, Greece, than in Germany because basically people trust neither the political stability of the country or the policy of support. So just understanding the relationship between risk and reward and policy confidence, etc., as a determinant of what at the end of the day is a very capital intensive transition is, is a starting point. And it gets you usefully into this debate about, well, if we assume, you know, real policy stability and this level of support and confidence, then the cost of capital can come down to this kind of level, in which case this becomes the cheapest kind of source. And that, I think, is, is a first base. Obviously, then you would, you're quite right, want to start getting a bit more micro in, OK, what, you know, what's the role of debt versus equity? Um, what financial instruments might I have? Some of these are questions to the finance sector, uh, by the way. Um, and then finally, you might want to consider teaming up with finance people because as I've looked more at this, it reminds me of the old innovation chain stuff and technology, which was actually the technology value of death is because technology push doesn't meet the, the market demand. And in finance, I think we have a similar issue that, you know, you can do all of the policy engineering you like, but if the financial sector is seriously screwed up, it's still not going to work. You can have all the smart finance, green bond instruments you like, but if the market demand on the energy policy side is screwed up, it still ain't going to work. So getting those to meet effectively is what will get a lot of finance flowing uh, into the low carbon transition. And I think that involves some understanding of both, the, if you like, the supply and demand forces upon the finance. Thank you. I think, um, what? Okay, last question. Doan Kilish from KIT. Uh, you mentioned that you would throw away uh, the model after getting an insight which you didn't expect it and you learned uh, maybe from that new insight. But um, uh, should we not critically reflect this insight we get? especially in the case of it's not expected, uh, because maybe it could rely on wrong model result and, and how to deal with uh, insight which we not expected in that case. Yeah. Well, of course, I was using that comment from our chief executive to kind of make a point. Obviously, it's not actually a very serious proposition to say that once you've got a single insight, you throw the model away. Uh, I think you're dead right. What it should do instead is say, oh, OK, so I think that's what's going on. Now, can we go back to this model and test this by doing this sensitivity or changing that way? Or can we find another model or something? But the point is, it is the, the, the point I was trying to emphasise is it's not, oh, the number's, you know, 2 billion uh, rather than 1.5. 
it's yeah what's going on here that's made it 2 billion rather than 1.5 and, and am I confident that that's really what's going on and why and will that affect my decision so that's the kind of um, point I was trying to stress uh, maybe just I'll mention one other thing if any some of you may have heard of this sort of three domains, three pillars approach to trying to classify the processes going on here. For those not, I've got some a, a short summary of, of the book that we published about three years ago, which tried to bring all this together in some depth. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave them on the side there if, if of interest. Thank you very much. I think that's that is a subject that we could could take for the next uh, for next EMPE to have a to have a focus group on just on like really class not classify the models but really understand the differences and the slight difference as how they are hybridized mm. and um, yeah thank you very much thank you